Okay, once again, um, and can you hear me well in the in here? Yeah. So uh, I was saying that uh, my research has a twofold focus. On the one hand, to better understand uh, the term uh, multimodality, and on the other hand, to look into the different modes of perception in a multimodal meaning making practices. So uh, to begin with, uh, what is multimodality? Uh, of course, the term is associated with the works of uh, Gunther Kress and Theo van der Wien. Okay. Yeah. Multimodality yes. <laughs> challenges <laughs> being online and on site. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Paulus. So let me just click uh, here. Okay, so um, of course the term is associated with the works of Gunther Kress and Theo van Leeuwen, and in particular those two works dating back to 1996 and 2001. Um, but in fact, it addresses a phenomenon which is uh, older than that, which is uh, as old as representation itself, and of course, crucial to all forms of uh, human communication. And for some people, um, this late, uh, this recent interest in a multimodality and uh, multimodality research is seen as the late discovery of the obvious. So uh, why uh, my multimodality, why, has been, uh, why this term has been gaining ground recently? Uh, well, there might be um, a range of reasons, but one of them is that it has been increasingly prevalent in ed education and in research, just like for conferences, for example. And also that uh, more and more learners have multimodal um, skills. And so the teachers uh, need to uh, address those um, multimodal needs. But uh, which multimodality are we talking about after all? Because uh, what we should say is that uh, there is a common ambiguity uh, linked with the idea of multimodality, namely that multimodality is uh, multimediality or digitality. And uh, when it comes to educational practices, more often than not, uh, multimodality is associated and sometimes even equaled to technology-mediated learning. And um, even though multimodality goes hand in hand with digitality, uh, one should be careful not to reduce uh, the former to the latter. And um, in, a similar, in a similar stance, Shipka has critiqued the way multimodality is um, very often conflated with digitality. So, um, as, um, so as a conclusion, we could say that the term mode multimodality uh, really lacks precision at, at this stage. So what multimodality are we talking about? But not, not the one that we uh, came across during the pan pandemic and when we were doing online teaching. So um, what we mean by multimodality, one of the ways of seeing this is, of course, through sensory modes. This is one of the possible definitions. Uh, so the notion of modality is often reduced to sensory modes. That's why referring to multimodal learning environments, uh, Sankey states, for instance, that multimodal learning environments allow instructional elements to be presented in more than one sense, for example, e visual or oral. Um, Bergen also pointed out action uh, and motor control as a form of modality. Um, the conventional notion of mode and modality governing linguistic communication is grounded on the idea of mode as a skill. So in linguistic context, mode and modality are seen more like the linguistic skills, so reading, listening, writing and speaking. Um, mode can also be uh, interpreted as a channel of communication. So in this case, the term mode is uh, used to conflate with different channels of oral and written communication. Um, and this approach is uh, based on tools and te technology-mediated channels. 
Um, for instance, we could um, compare and oppose telephone to face-to-face -face communication as a mode uh, and modality of communication. Uh, furthermore, formats of communication can also be interpreted as modes. Uh, for example, uh, presentation as opposed to conversation or interview. Um, but uh, within the field of semiotics, and as defined by Kress and Van Leeuwen, a mode is seen more as a semiotic resource. And um, to the best of my knowledge, this is what the previous speaker, uh, Kay O'Halloran, also referred to as modality and mode as a semiotic resource. And um, in a more sociocultural view, Crest defines mode as socially shaped and culturally given semiotic resource for, for making meaning. So, um, one of the uh, ideas of this research was also to focus not only on multimodal artifacts, but also on multimodal practices and processes. Prior, for, uh, for instance, points out uh, to this um, problem, uh, to the problematic nature of Cress's definition and Cress's focus on artifacts rather than practices. And so he mentions that a striking feature of multimodality studies in general is the almost exclusive focus on texts and other semiotic objects. And multimodality studies rarely involve close attention to how people make distribute or use multimodal texts and objects. And this was um, exactly the focus of uh, the case study that I'm going to show you right after, which was to understand uh, the ways in which learners make use of uh, different semiotic resources. So um, we're exploring multimodality in a wider sense. Um, and in the way that Stockel defines, so as communicative artifacts and processes, so I highlight the processes, which combine various sign systems, modes, and whose production and reception calls upon the communicators to semantically and formally interrelate to sign repertoires present. So uh, similar practice-oriented approaches to multimodality research um, can be found in Norris, Scollin, and Jones. Um, most studies on multimodal learning environments also focus on the input. Um, Inquiring into the learner's experience of multimodal practices, as well as the learning outcome, that is to say their multimodal productions, what and how students learn um, in a multimodal environment is also the focus of the study. So not only to inquire into the in input, but also to the output. So uh, when it comes to designing multimodal learning environments, um, what are the categories, what are the things that we could put into to make the learning environment multimodal? Um, of course, there is the teaching content, that is to say the semiotic resources that we bring into the class. It can be video, audio materials, images, etc. But also the different uh, modes of communicating and delivering the teaching materials. Um, and finally, um, paying attention and assessing to learners' um, multimodal productions across different modes. Um, uh, in what follows, I'm going to um, share with you um, a, a small scale case study that I carried out recently, uh, which was based uh, in particular on situated multimodal practices. So just, uh, just quickly on the um, research context, it was a three-day creativity workshop with Graduate School of Management of Grenoble Art University in France. And um, it included participants of the master's level, so first and second year master students, who worked in small groups of four to six, but who majored in different fields. Because one of the um, purposes of this workshop also was to, um, to foster multidisciplinarity and see how uh, students with different uh, scientific backgrounds um, interpret and use uh, different semiotic resources. All in all, there were 24 participants. And of course, this is a very limited sample and this is the limitation of the research, but um, its purpose was to gain a qualitative insight into uh, multimodal meaning making practices. So maybe uh, later on, this study could be uh, done on a larger scale to gain uh, quantitative insight. Um, 
In this workshop, learners were offered opportunities to engage in situated multimodal practices to experience different learning modalities, which extensively involved interaction. Um, the goal was uh, for them to be confronted with a real life uh, research problem uh, on the very first day. So they discovered their research problem and they needed to come up with an innovative solution on the second day. And finally, on their last day, a material representation uh, was to be uh, made uh, through a poster, video or a product box. So uh, participants were uh, really free to uh, make their own uh, semiotic choices to, to choose the way they they wanted to represent their uh, solution. Um, there were um, some different multimodal practices which were involved in this uh, in the design of the workshop, like for example, individual and teamwork in small and large groups, uh, the jigsaw method. I could develop further on the method if, if needed. Uh, it was intended to, uh, to make a rotation of group members. So learners were working in one group and then they were asked to rotate and change their groups. Uh, collective intelligence games, uh, brainstorming techniques and exercises, role play storytelling. So all those um, multimodal practices were part of this uh, workshop. Um, the research draws actually on two sets of data. On the one hand, the learner evaluations of their multimodal experience. So a questionnaire uh, survey was introduced at the very last day, the third day, uh, so as to gain feedback on learners uh, evaluation of their own experience. And secondly, um, we, uh, we had a set of multimodal artifacts, their productions of the third day to be uh, analyzed to be analyzed. The questionnaire survey, as I mentioned, was uh, submitted to learners at the end of the workshop and sought to elicit learner evaluations of different components of the learning environment. And they, uh, those questions constitute the analytical categories under which uh, the results uh, of the case study will be discussed further. So um, why uh, such a focus on, on the learners? Why um, through their questionnaires and their personal experience of the uh, multimodal experience, it's because uh, the self-reflecting processes was aimed at helping learners enhance their overall multimodal literacy by developing awareness of meaning-making processes in which they were engaged, and also to raise their awareness of semiotic affordances of different resources that they were dealing with and that they were tapping into to represent their final solutions. So, um, as I said, one of the practices was the individual work versus small and large group work. And uh, the switch between those different learning modalities enabled them to share and exchange their ideas uh, in a more dynamic and efficient way. Um, there was a, a cross fertilization of ideas because learners were brought to build on each other's ideas and ultimately come up with a solution which had nothing to do with their initial idea. Um, yeah, just increased interaction. Uh, also, as I mentioned, there was a, a rotation of group members um, and in short exercises, 15 to 20 minutes, learners were asked to change groups every five minutes so that each learner had the chance to participate in discussions in each of the subgroups. As learners changed groups, um, other participants provided explanations on uh, what solutions they were working on, and to do so, they were explicitly asked to use a language, uh, but also other semiotic resources such as drawings, diagrams. Um, so the new members were encouraged to complete the drawings and suggest some new ideas using as many semiotic resources as possible. So this mode of communication allowed learners to take a step back from their own problem because when they were rotating and going to other groups, they were they were working on new problems. So um, they could could uh, bring a new perspective to to this. Uh, research questions and this multimodal practice also uh, brought an undeniable cognitive be benefit that of enhanced clarity because when participants were trying to explain their own uh, solutions and the problems they were confronted with um, this oral um, explicitation of their problems helped them clarify. 
Um, uh, in the face of ideation and brainstorming, uh, two different techniques were used. One of them was the postage note technique, as we know very well. And uh, in this uh, multimodal practice, uh, ideas actually take shape and they become tangible because uh, participants use uh, one postage note per idea. And um, this technique helps them later on to reorganize their ideas in categories. Also, uh, another technique, uh, which is called brain writing, uh, was used. And uh, this technique is basically, as, as its name suggests, based on writing or only. Uh, in a silent way, uh, participants take on each other's ideas and they uh, develop it further in a writing form. Um, different collective intelligence games make part of the workshop as well, and those collective intelligence games are complex multimodal communicative practices uh, in so far as they involve gesture, posture, body language, oral language, but uh, it can also include uh, writing and drawing. Uh, Three different uh, types of stimuli or multimodal stimuli were used uh, to uh, accompany participants. Uh, first, the verbal stimuli, symbols, and uh, we used um, the list of uh, Canton Rosanov. This is, this is a list of 100 words. It's, it's in French, but I guess it also exists in English. Uh, this list um, is established as being um, the one that creates the most associations uh, in uh, participants. The second category of stimuli that they were exposed to were visual stimuli, such as Dixit images or other um, abstract paintings uh, from, from art. Uh, and finally, there were audio stimuli, and we used uh, two different playlists developed by Scott Dorley, the creative director of the D School of Stanford University. Uh, one of the playlists is called Active, and it includes dynamic music, and the other one is more calm and uh, reflective playlist. So participants were exposed to all uh, those uh, different uh, stimuli and uh, they had to come up with uh, multimodal productions to represent their um, solutions. I'm going to um, skip a bit quickly, I'm trying to moderate myself. Um, seven, minutes. seven minutes, okay, thank you, uh, Alin. So um, I'm going to uh, show you the multimodal productions of uh, three groups in two stages. Uh, what, I, what will be labeled as initial multimodal productions and then uh, final multimodal productions. So those uh, multimodal productions were uh, realized before the stimuli actually. And uh, just to give you the quick context, they were asked to represent the problem of negotiation of holidays between um, parents and children. When a family needs to go on holidays, how do they negotiate uh, the, the holiday activities? So um, this is one of the group's uh, production. Uh, this is the second group. The writing is in French, but um, I think it's still, um, here and finally uh, this one you have the parents and you have the negotiation and you have the different activities that they can do um, on holiday once they were uh, exposed to different um, uh, stimuli they came up with new uh, solutions uh, and this was another um, research question this one was how to um, help students engage more on campus or organization. So this is the final production of uh, group one, um, final production of group two, uh, and we can see uh, more images, it is more structured, and also uh, the final production of uh, group three. Um, maybe it is a quick analysis, but um, what we noticed is that uh, when students were exposed to more uh, semiotic uh, resources, uh, this helped them become aware of the existence of those semiotic resources and their affordances. And so later on, they, they didn't really hesitate to tap into those different resources to uh, make their own representations. So um, 
just to um, sum up two uh, core modes uh, were involved in their final productions, basically image and language, but with their medieval, uh, medial story uh, variants, static image, writing. <laughs> Learners also used um, very often capital letters to facilitate reading and writing was accomplished in uh, different directions um, so as to suggest in a way the, uh, the direction of the narrative which was to unfold in their drawings and also there was a wide use of submodes such as color vectors and perspective lines arrows and forms were used to make uh, diagrammatic representations uh, to show the different the relation of different elements in their representations I also had a video, but I don't know whether I have time to show. It's two, so it's two minutes, yeah. So uh, this is the um, final multimodal production of one of the groups working on exoskeletons. But it, how can I make the sound? Is it, do you think it's, it's connected to the sound? Yeah, I can see. Well, we don't have the sound, but but it's okay. Yeah, we have it. I'm going to stop the video here, but the idea is that um, at the beginning, they were all thinking of presenting their solutions in a PowerPoint presentation. And as we moved on through the workshop, more and more ideas came. And even uh, this video um, doesn't use language at all. It's all, it's all visual. I how to escape and... To move on to the next slide. I don't know how to skip the video and maybe here. Yeah, and also, uh, thank you. And one last uh, mode of representation that they used was um, cardboard prototyping as well. This, this is not their presentation, but this is an example of cardboard prototyping. So, uh, the possibility to express themselves multimodality, multimodally, sorry, was experienced by the participants as an advantage, which unleashed their creativity as to the choice of semiotic resources. Um, one of the participants uh, mentioned in the questionnaire survey as a feedback that drawings enable them to go to the point directly. And these are efficient tools which help avoid wasting time on trying to find the perfect wording to explain one's point. Um, also, interestingly, one of the participants compared the opportunity that was given to them to express themselves, tapping into a wide range of semiotic resources to gaining more space to express themselves and to represent meaning, as if they shifted from a two-dimensional space that of representing by a pen or a paper or a keyboard and a screen, uh, as for regular PowerPoint presentations, to a richer and multi-dimensional space. Uh, participants also felt that their skills to express themselves differently, uh, multimodally developed, um, and they affirmed uh, that in the beginning, not being able, even those who affirmed in the beginning that they were not able to draw, they ended up using drawings excessively to illustrate their ideas. So, to sum up with the added value of situated multimodal practices, 
Uh, this brings in um, certain dynamics uh, in, the, in the classroom. Well, this was the case for this workshop, and it uh, contributed to learners feeling more engaged in the learning process and being more uh, productive. It can also help um, participants to uh, go through the multimodal experience and enhance their capacity to better analyze affordances of different semiotic resources and adapt their choices. Uh, in meaning making processes, it is vital to understand the meaning potentials, and this is uh, something also uh, Kay O'Halloran mentioned, the meaning potentials of the resources as precisely and as explicitly as we can, uh, in order to be able to choose consciously the most appropriate semiotic resource to make and represent meaning. And I think uh, at this point, this is one of the challenges that we face. Uh, we don't really realize uh, the potential of each semiotic resource, and we're not always conscious of our choices. Uh, the learner's ability to design increasingly multimodal artifacts uh, in, in the framework of this workshop showed a positive impact of the multimodal learning environment on their capacity to creatively choose and combine a wide range of semiotic resources to make, negotiate and represent meaning in a multimodal perspective. Uh, to put to test uh, the findings of this uh, study and compensate its limitations in terms of the small number of participants, uh, uh, as I said, a larger um, quantitative approach can be adopted. Refocusing multimodality research attention to situations of use and the complex dynamics of situated semiotic practice uh, can also be a plus to go beyond uh, the perception of uh, multimodality just in terms of artifacts. And that's it. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tina. So your presentation was very good and uh, informative and clear. There's only one thing I don't understand, and that is in your abstract, uh, because you you write uh, uh, that the paper addresses multimodality and not as an approach to analysis. What do you mean with that? Uh, I mean, don't you make an analysis? Uh, and you definitely present conclusions, uh, and, and uh, I mean, um, probably uh, your conclusions are not limited to the socio-semiotic framework of Christoph von Lohen, but still, uh, at least I think that, that you are indicating an analysis here. Thank you for your feedback. Of course, you're right. Uh, I present um, analysis, but what I meant in my abstract is that um, the way multimodality was introduced into research was through the notion of MDA, multimodal discourse analysis. And um, in, in my research, I'm trying to, uh, to tackle multimodality as a mode of learning. Of course, at some point uh, I analyze their multimodal productions and here I use the analysis, as you mentioned, but uh, I'm also trying to explore the, the potential of multimodality uh, as a learning modality, as a way to learn and uh, discover different uh, semiotic resources, their potentials and the way learners can combine different uh, semiotic resources to, to represent meaning. So sorry if that wasn't clear in the abstract. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone? I don't know whether we have. Maybe just to check. So if I may, okay, yeah. uh, may I ask you a question? Uh, just speaking, I find it compelling this uh, definition of modality as a resource. But, uh, at the same time, uh, my question is, uh, how do you think it's called practical context play, come into play here? I mean, uh, in, what I mean is that in one sense, you might learn different modalities, uh, visual or linguistic, but in the other sense, there are things like well, 
domains or practical contexts, like you can learn art or science or whatever else. And it's also a resource for meaning making in a sense. I mean, uh, art is a great resource for making meaning, but it's not a modality in this sense, uh, in the sense that you use the term. So what do you think is the connection here? There is one. Yeah, thank you for your question. Well, actually, of course, art is, is a great modality. It's a mode of uh, representing things. Uh, what I mean by uh, mode is a semiotic resource. It's even in, in art, when an artist tries to represent an emotion, he makes a choice. Does he go for a photo or does he paint? So for me, uh, in, in the context of art, he has all those uh, semiotic resources at his disposal. And then he makes a choice to represent the meaning he, he, he wishes to convey the meaning. I don't know whether that answers your question, Paulus, but yeah, this is the connection I see. Okay, thanks. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, I don't know how to escape. Yeah, maybe here I can escape. Okay. I'm going to use uh, yeah. my power of being here to introduce the next speaker, trying to not to mispronounce his name, Eugenio. Israel Chavez Barreto is a PhD student at the Department of Semiotics at Dartmouth University. He studied linguistics at the National School of Anthropology and History in Mexico, and his main research interests are general semiotics, biosemiotics, and the history of semiotics and linguistics. His current research consists in the elaboration of a monograph about Louis Prieto's semiotic theory. And uh, today he's going to give a talk on modeling systems and semiotic structures. The floor is yours. Don't forget to share. Okay. On Zoom. Oh, I'm not here. Let's try the other one. Okay. Let's go back to him. There we go. Okay. Okay, so, uh, Hello to everyone, and uh, thank you for being here, both here and online. And uh, I hope you can all hear me well. So uh, the, the, the topic of, of, of my presentation uh, is sort of a, a, a very old uh, uh, problem, uh, main, namely, uh, it's about the, the relationships between language, <clears throat> and by this I, I, I mostly mean natural verbal language and thought. And now uh, I believe I wouldn't be too wrong if I would say that uh, sometimes this problem has been approached as a sort of uh, tension between communication and cognition with the discussion thus revolving around uh, what is the main function of language. Uh, is it to be the support of thought, or even to enable it, or is it to be uh, a vehicle for uh, externalizing our ideas? Uh, 
a sort of semiotic variation on this topic was uh, put forward by uh, Thomas Sebeok's idea that uh, speech uh, is uh, an acceptation of, uh, of language. And thus, uh, communication uh, is a sort of uh, subsidi subsidiary, subsidiary uh, uh, function of, uh, uh, that, that would have eventually like co-opted language and, and making it seem that the proper pur purpose of, uh, of language is communication while it actually, the, the, like the true function actually is, uh, or the true purpose actually is uh, modeling uh, in the sense of, uh, say, cognition or, or, or knowing. Um, now, <clears throat> I, just to be clear, I, I think Sebok is in a way right uh, with, with this claim. Uh, but I also think that uh, there are some aspects of, of, of language, for instance, uh, the way it changes, that uh, cannot be properly explained without taking into account its communica communicative functions. So uh, to this extent, uh, it seems that it might be useful to draw a more or less clear distinction between these two aspects. So let me introduce some, some terminology. Uh, so uh, I will refer to modeling systems as any science system in as much as it is regarded as having as its main aim, the ordering of perception. Uh, now, in as much uh, as a modeling system is a science system, a modeling system will determine a way of knowing things. And because of this, I think it's not so wrong to put an emphasis on perception because I sort of uh, ascribe to this position in which knowledge begins in like sense perception. Uh, now, by, by semiotic structure, uh, I mean any science system which is uh, regarded as or in as much as it is regarded as having as its main aim uh, to enable practices. Uh, now, within semiotic structures, uh, science systems that are regarded as enabling the specific practice of communication, uh, I will call them semic structures. Uh, and I borrow this term from uh, Eric uh, Buisson. So uh, now just let me insist for the, for the sake of uh, clarity uh, on the fact that I am not claiming that there are two kinds of science systems like uh, modeling and semiotic structures. I am saying that depending upon the way we look at them, uh, they can reveal a prominence of one or the other function. So uh, now let me also notice in passing that uh, I am not completely happy about uh, uh, calling semiotic structure the genus to which semic structure uh, uh, belongs. Uh, but well, uh, if you have a, a, a suggestion, I would uh, appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, in any case, uh, 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 in this talk, I will only, uh, or yeah, I will be primarily concerned with the science systems in as much as they can be regarded as semic structures. But notice that semic, semic uh, structure here is just a specific case uh, of semiotic structures because there are certainly a lot of other practices that are enabled by science systems besides, com besides uh, uh, communication. Uh, and also uh, to keep it uh, a bit clear, uh, by communication, <laughs> I am mostly meaning something like uh, an intentional transmission of knowledge. Uh, and I am mostly referring to linguistic communication. Uh, model, I am mostly understanding it uh, in, in the spirit of uh, Lotman and, and, and the Tart Moscow School. So I would more or less define a model as an analogous of perception which substitutes the object being perceived, but it does so, uh, it does so uh, following certain rules of uh, pragmatic relevance. So uh, namely the model will retain some features and relations between features of the object that, uh, that are pragmatically relevant. So a model would be sort of a diagram, uh, in, like maybe in the, in the Persian sense. I hope you can read, I, I, I didn't uh, expect the room to be so big. I, I was, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking that we would have like a more intimate, uh, but well, <laughs> so um, yes. Uh, 
okay, uh, I will uh, not go any further into the notion of model, but uh, I will notice that uh, on the basis of this definition of uh, modeling, which was uh, to some extent the one that Sebjörg uh, was using alongside uh, Uxkul's Umwelt, uh, it can be claimed that uh, when we consider a science system as a modeling system, we emphasize the fact that uh, this science system uh, orders perception. Uh, and th this is uh, sort of important to remember. Now, uh, by practice, because as I said, uh, semiotic structures would enable practices. By practice, I mean uh, following Luis Prieto, uh, an intentional transformation of an object in order to produce another object. So uh, notice that the object uh, being produced can either be a material object, as when we build a bookshelf out of uh, uh, wood planks, or a mental object, precisely as when we try to convey a certain message. Thus, uh, communication can be considered as a practice, but because of its specific nature, uh, it can be useful to have a special uh, designations for science systems in as much as we regard them uh, as enabling that specific practice, which would be communication. Now, the underlying aim of my proposal, uh, or well, of this talk, <laughs> is uh, to determine the place of language within other sign systems, and more specifically within culture. So I will be uh, assuming that between the sign systems that make up the whole culture, there is something like complementarity. Uh, no sign systems functions on its own, I believe. And the processes they enable are thus always the result of the workings of more than one sign system. Yet, uh, I, I don't think this assumption is ungrounded. And, and perhaps I wouldn't have to like prove this to you because this is a session about multimodality. But in any case, uh, consider uh, the, uh, this case. Uh, a person utters the following sentence. Uh, I think that the new James Bond movie supports colonialism. Uh, now, the utterance conveys many other things than the proper linguistic content. It could, for instance, inform us about the provenance of the speaker if they have, for instance, a French accent or a Washington accent. Uh, it might also inform us about some of their beliefs or about their tastes in movies or about any other thing. Now, at the same time, the speaker, in order to utter this sentence, is also recurring not simply to language, uh, to, I mean, to a linguistic structures that uh, allows them to express something but also to other sign systems, precisely other sign systems that are determining, uh, determining uh, a way of knowing uh, the new James Bond movie, <laughs> uh, and by means of which it appears as supporting colonialism or uh, in any other way. Now, uh, in this sense, uh, the, 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 the utterance as such is both a process enabled by, let us assume, a semic structure to the extent uh, that the utterance is a realization of a practice, but it is also a process enabled by a modeling system to the extent that it is determined by ways of knowing the new James Bond movie. Uh, so from, from this perspective, uh, verbal language uh, appears as embedded uh, as within uh, a web of uh, sign systems. And certainly uh, in this regard, Sevok's view becomes uh, very relevant. Uh, for uh, modeling is a primary function of language, I believe to the extent that language is able to build upon other sign systems. Indeed, uh, it can be claimed that uh, language takes other sign systems and regards, regards them as purport upon which it casts <laughs> the net of its form, uh, turning them into immediate substance. Uh, I mean, semiotic substance, and thus into expressible semiotic magnitudes. But notice that if language has modeling as a primary function, to the extent that it's able to consider our science, other sign systems as furnishing it with its content purport, the natural conclu conclusion would be that uh, this is an operation geared towards expression. <laughs> In other words, language is primary modeling because modeling is a necessary condition for carrying out practices. And in the case of language, that practice is especially uh, communication. 
But we, we might ask uh, if this ability of language is due solely to its modeling capacities or to something else. So my proposal uh, is that the distinction between modeling systems and semic structures, uh, but probably also semiotic structures in general, uh, is that they differ in the constitutive movement <laughs> that creates them. So I will explain this. Oh, okay. Okay, so I will explain this, uh, yes, the first. Oh, yeah, this is good. So in order to explain what I mean, uh, I need first to tell you that uh, my proposal is based on Prieto's notion of uh, intercomprehension system. Uh, so for, for Prieto, uh, the content plane of a science system, and Prieto precisely uses the term semiotic structure, that's why I use it also, uh, uh, Yes, uh, the content plane differs from the expression, expression plane uh, in that the content plane is submitted to a double classification. Uh, a classification, so first there is a classification that determines signifies, and then there is a classification that determines senses. So the classification system that determines senses uh, determines what can be said by means of a given language, uh, a given language, uh, let's say. But in as much it classifies the same entities, so the same substance, let us say, uh, uh, that compose uh, 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 the content plane of a, of a lang, uh, it is called uh, a cannot. Uh, um, I, I think I, I made a mistake here in what I am reading. So, uh, so in the content plane, we have two classification systems. Uh, one determines, signify, uh, uh, gives you signifieds and the other gives these senses. And the classification system that determines senses determines what can be said by means of a given lack. But uh, in as much as it classifies the same en en entities uh, that are the, the, the signifieds, uh, then this classification system is called a connotative classification system. So uh, the connotative classification system uh, uh, classifies uh, th this connotative classification system, which classifies the substance of content in a natural language, must derive its pertinence from another plane. So it must belong to another uh, sign system. And the other sign system is precisely the intercomprehension system. Uh, th that is what Prieto is saying. Uh, and in, in the intercomprehension system, the connotative classification system actually establishes an expression plane. Uh, so the plain content of a given lang uh, is regarded as the plane of expression of the given lang's intercomprehension system. Uh, so the same plane uh, has both functions, but uh, is, it is content in lang, and then it is expression in the intercomprehension system. Uh, so uh, Prieto's proposal allows us to think that the intercomprehension system itself might partake of another sign system in as much as its content plane would be also submitted to a double classification and thus it would become the expression plane of another sign system. The question here arises, namely, uh, if what is content from one point of view can be expression from another, then what is expression uh, uh, can be content from another point of view too. Thus, uh, the question is, can the expression plane of a lang uh, be content from another point of view. So I would think that this could be possible either uh, for sign systems that are codifying natural language and that sometimes are called uh, substitutives, substitutive uh, uh, sign systems like uh, Morse code or other forms of uh, encryption, or uh, maybe in some forms of uh, phonetic poetry and, and similar kinds of artistic uh, experimentation. Uh, for Prieto, however, the attention is given to the intercomprehension system and to the enchainment that it generates. Uh, for its endpoint is, according to Prieto, a sign system in which objects signify the subject itself. So uh, this uh, leads him to propose a theory of the subject, which uh, I will not discuss today, but, but it's important to, to, to keep that in mind. Uh, now, uh, the question of whether the expression plane of a lang 
can be regarded as content is also interesting because it highlights that from one point of view, the trajectory Prieto, Prieto proposes would have uh, sort of a direction. <laughs> the enchainment goes from language to subject, at least in the way he presents it in, in pertinence and, and practice. He, that's uh, the book where he talks about these things. Uh, the question, of course, is whether this enchainment would look the same in the other direction. Uh, but before I go into that, I would like to make uh, a recapitulation uh, and also to conclude. Uh, so I have said that uh, science systems can be considered in at least two ways. In as much as they are ordering perception and thus determine, determining a way of knowing, they are modeling systems. And in as much as they enable practices, they are semiotic structures. If the practice is communication, then they are semic structures. In the case of language, which is both a modeling system and a semic structure, we saw that its modeling character was more general than its semic character, because modeling is more general than communicating. This brought us to the question of whether a Lang's modeling capacity was the sole, was the only factor that could account to the fact that language seems to be able to express all contents. So in order to answer this, we brought Prieto's notion of intercomprehension system to, uh, uh, to introduce the notion of uh, connotative classification systems by means of which the content plane of a given sign system, a Lang in this case, can become the expression plane of another sign system. Uh, yeah, so all this was brought up in order to explain what is the constitutive movement by means of which modeling systems and sem semiotic structures differ. Very well. My proposal is that. Uh, in as much as they enable practices, semiotic structures function via a connotative movement. Uh, whereas in as much as they determine a way of knowing uh, via ordering perception, modeling systems function via a metalinguistic movement. Uh, so to be sure, uh, the connotative movement is sort of Prieto's trajectory in the original direction. It goes from lang to subject. Uh, the metalinguistic movement would be Prieto's trajectory, but in the opposite direction. So from subject to lang uh, or to language. Uh, now, the adjective uh, metalinguistic refers to meta language, but by meta language, uh, I, I'm mostly understanding here uh, uh, a language of description built upon, uh, say, lower level uh, sign systems. Uh, yes, but basically that would be my presentation. <laughs> so uh, I can elaborate on the Q and A and yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you Virginia, for your uh, interesting presentation, for your being prompt when it was time and your elegant slides, thank you. <laughs> they were nice. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, please. Um, it's a question for understanding. I think it was really interesting uh, and challenging. Um, so you have two perspectives of the sign, the modeling perspective and the communication or the semiotic perspective. And, and I fully, fully agree. I mean, modeling is one way of seeing things. Um, but you also said that practice is the intentional transformation of an object in order to produce another object. And that is part of the semiotic, not the modeling. But when you are doing modeling, at least in the humanities, and I think the sciences too, what you're doing is to create media objects. You're creating a communication situation, often based on previous media objects, very concrete, you make um, a bag of words to study statistical literature. So isn't that an intentional transformation of an object in order to produce another object? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, I really mean that. <laughs> because uh, um, uh, so uh, there are several things here. One. Uh, this presentation is like the second part of a previous presentation, which of course I couldn't present here, <laughs> in which I sort of explain things like that. But uh, the other uh, thing is that uh, I am really, I think, I think 
the distinction is pertinent. I, I think it's relevant to make it, but I, I am struggling with the where exactly it is the, the division, because uh, indeed, uh, the creation of a model would be a practice, uh, yes. Uh, but I am, uh, I, 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 and that's why I was focusing only on, say, uh, uh, linguistic communication, uh, because of course, and, and of course, it involves uh, modeling. Uh, so uh, practices cannot uh, happen without modeling. Uh, Yes, but um, modeling is, is more general. Uh, uh, many people have, uh, well, not many people, but uh, some people, especially Kalevi Kul, he has suggested me uh, that this different, th this distinction rather is, is uh, uh, a distinction between auto communication and hetero communication. Uh, and perhaps that would be better, uh, a better way to look at it. Uh, I myself, I think uh, it rather involves uh, or, or is, sort of reminiscent of this distinction between a theory of sign reception and a theory of sign production in, in echo. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer for, <laughs> for your question <laughs> because I, 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 I am still struggling with the, the distinction. Like, I think there is a distinction there that, that is good to address, especially in the case of language. Uh, yeah, because that would, mainly mean that uh, it's not about either communication or cognition, but both. Uh, but then uh, let's differentiate the bo uh, two of them. Yeah, both of them. Uh, but yes, thank you. A very good and long answer to a question I wouldn't have been able to ask. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. I think we have another question here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so Mr. Chavez, uh, very interesting. I've been following your presentations for a while now. And uh, one thing that I may contextualize here is that I think of Israel's theory as pure mathematics. In the thematic realm, it would be the pure mathematics for me. And I can barely sometimes see uh, the light of at the, at the end of the tunnel when it comes to how to apply this. And the question is, can you go back to the slide where you show this three-dimensional model of language that is not a model of the subject, but could be a model of the subject. Um, and if you can tell us something about this being uh, or having a potential for being applied as a theory of the subject, not a theory or a model of language, but of a subject. Yes, thank you, Oscar. And uh, really thank you, because I, I, I think uh, our friendship has sort of blinded you, <laughs> but uh, but thank you. Uh, but um, yeah, actually, I will. Um, uh, I will. Yeah. Well. Anyway, um, it, it is uh, in in Prieto uh, because th this is this is mostly Prieto, and uh, in Prieto, it is this enchainment of semiotic structures what eventually uh, sort of uh, takes him into the consideration of, of, of subjectivity because he says, well, uh, and uh, I've heard that uh, this was sort of uh, his answer to uh, Persian infinite semiosis, uh, but, but uh, Prieto thought that uh, it couldn't be infinite. It, it, it should have like some end point. Uh, of course, he doesn't even address it as infinite semiosis, and, and I don't know if it is really a, 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 like a dialogue with Peirce on the side of Prieto. But uh, anyway, uh, the point here is that uh, he, he, he doesn't think that, that this enchainment can be infinite. So uh, he says that the starting point must be this sign system in which uh, 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 the subject itself uh, is uh, signified. and. Uh, uh, this is, uh, he, he writes this in 1975 in, in Pertinence and Practice, and he won't really develop this theory of the subject until the 80s, uh, like around 84, 85, uh, uh, yeah. And, but, uh, uh, well, that theory of the subject, I, I, it, it is interesting, I think, uh, and for a while I was thinking that uh, uh, 
Prieto's theory of the subject could be the way, uh, the way to go if I wanted to make Prieto relevant for contemporary semiotics and especially biosemiotics. Uh, now I am not so sure <laughs> because it seems that uh, uh, it is very, uh, let's say like uh, Prieto's theory is a theory of anthroposemiosis. So uh, uh, I think when it comes to human uh, uh, subjects, uh, maybe it can work very well. Uh, if you want to apply it uh, to uh, other semiotic uh, phenomena, I would say, uh, I think uh, too many changes uh, have to be done um, in some parts. Because uh, the interesting thing about his theory is that Prieto, uh, he, he defines, or, or well, he found subjectivity and, and the capacity of, of, of like, like uh, he says that a subject is only a subject in as much it has a capacity to choose. And, and this is what has been, all, uh, it, yeah, biosemiotics has been, has been saying this already in, in, in recent uh, years. So uh, uh, it seemed to fit very well. But uh, then when it comes to animals, Prieto is not so sure that they can choose and then that is where problems arise. But uh, uh, yeah, but yes, I, I, I don't want to, uh, it, all the time, but uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we have to stop here, and if we have other questions, we can continue on with the cup of coffee after our next uh, speaking talk. So thank you very much, Eugenio. Mm -hmm. I invite uh, Ina Melnikov. Ina Melnikov. No, it's not here. Board. It's sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um. Yeah, I'll introduce from here. Ina Melkulova, yes, sorry. Um, yep. So Ina Melkulova is Associate Professor and Director of the International Center of Semiotics and Intercultural Dialogue at the State Academic University of the Humanities in Moscow. And uh, she's Associate Researcher at the Sense Text Informatics History Laboratory at Sorbonne University and also the representative of Russia on the executive board of the IAS. Um, after a doctoral dissertation on semiotics and graphics, she focuses her research on literary semiotics, intercultural dialogue and theory of translation. Her recent books include semiotics, graphics and denunciation in contemporary French prose, uh, which appeared in 2019, uh, New Normality, New Life Forms, Semiotics in the Era of Crises, which appeared in Moscow in 2021, so really um, recent one. And uh, today, uh, Inna Melkulova is going to uh, make a presentation on the ecology of culture in 2021, perception of the senses in the biosphere and the semiosphere. She online? Yes. Okay, hello. Hello. So, the floor is yours. Um, you can share your slides. Yes, I will do. Um, thank you. Thank you, Inessa. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity to participate in this important event. Um, and now I will share my screen, just a moment. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, in June 2021, UNESCO launched the United Nations Decade for Ecosystem Restoration with the topic Restoring the Human Nature Bond. The main purpose of the program is to remind us that there is only one Earth. There is no one planet for nature and another for humans. The COVID-19 pandemic underscores the interdependence of all living things on the planet and the need to reorient our societies to ensure a sustainable path. In the context of the conference, we are interested in the question, what is our perception of the new reality in which we live since 2020? In the footsteps of Chekhov. We will start with a quote and the theatrical metaphor. If we talk about the world today, if we try to conceptualize it, the first idea that comes to mind 
is that all the worlds are stage, according to the Shakespearean formula. Russian speakers are familiar with a quote from the great playwright Chekhov, everything ought to be beautiful in a human being, face and dress and soul and ideas. The sentence has often been analyzed by literary critics, philosophers, historians, and semioticians. Yuri Lotman referred to Chekhov in a series of televised conferences. He quoted a letter where the writer sketched the portrait of a well-bred man. The one was polite, respectful for others, of others, and compassionate. The one who cultivates his internal aesthetic. Such a man, he said, is not only well-bred or cultivated, he is all of this at the same time, he is free, he esteems himself. Today, Chekhov will be treated uh, like an um, ecologist author, because the Dr. Astra of Uncle Vanya does not cease warning us of this end of the Russian 19th century about the danger of exploring, um, exploiting nature. The ecological character of the play is obvious to com contemporary spectators. Of course, Uncle Wanya is a play that speaks love, love uh, lost illusions, but above all beauty, the beauty of the person, the beauty of the environment. This is the key to understand the parallel that Chekhov draws uh, between the destruction of forests and relationships. Soon, thanks to you, there is no, uh, uh, will be longer any fidelity no possibility of sacrifice on earth. The ecology of culture of Lihachev. Chekhov remains for entire generations of Russians uh, the man who embodies inner culture, intelligentness, which signals equality between inner creation and external one. Another example of the well bred man in the Chekhovian sense is Dmitry Lihachev. Graduate of the University of St. Petersburg, great philologist and historian of Russian culture. He was a friend of Yuri Lotman. Lihachev was involved in Lotman's publication projects and the semiotician cited the historian of culture in numerous articles. If Lotman refers to Chekhov in his characteristic of a uh, well-bred man possessing an imperial culture, it is also the echo of the Likachevian words that we hear, uh, that we hear there. Likachev argues, many people think an intelligent person, person is uh, uh, one who has read a lot, received a good education, has traveled a lot, knows several languages, uh, but uh, you can have it all and not be intelligent. And you can have almost none of this. And, but have an inner intelligence. Inner intelligence is not only in knowledge, but in the ability to perceive, to understand the other, in the ability to help others, in the ability to protect nature, not to throw everything around you. And this is the basis of the ecology of culture that Lihachev will propose a hundred years after Chekhov, at the end of the 20th century. For Lihachev, a human life is not a series of events, but a special organism, a biographical whole. And if ecology studies the world as a whole, then it must also study the house that a person builds for himself uh, throughout his life. This house is human culture. Lihachev postulates, if nature is necessary for man for his biological life, then the cultural environment is just as necessary for his spiritual and moral life. For Lihachev, there are uh, two section in, sections in ecology, biological ecology on the one hand and cultural or moral ecology on the other. The difference between the two ecologies is in the possibility of recovery. Loss in nature is recoverable up to certain limits. We can clean up polluted rivers and seas, we can replant forests, restore the number of animals. Nature itself helped, helps man because she is alive. The situation is different with cultural monuments. Their losses are irreparable because cultural monuments are always individual. Each monument is destroyed forever, forever deformed, forever injured. 
And we believe that Lihachev's position concerns both the external environment, cultural monuments, for example, and our internal cultural world. If our internal culture is not fueled by new impressions and knowledge, it can quickly deteriorate and the context context of the pandemic can serve us as an example. In the ecology of culture, Lihachev argues, I imagine myself looking at our Earth from space. Of course, this image of the S seen from space is proposed by a man of the 20th century. But what a surprise that it is exactly the same image that opens Vladimir Vernadsky's seminal book the biosphere. Vernadsky, academician Vladimir Ivanovich Vernadsky is one of the key figures of the history of Russian science and more broadly of world science. Today, Vernadsky's world and life are viewed in a broader historical context with a reconsideration of his contribution to the sciences and ideas of his time, in particular through the notions of bio, the biosphere and the noosphere, but also for its civic commitments. Bernatsky is a figure comparable to Leonardo da Vinci. For his 80th birthday, the Russian Academy of Sciences organized his homage through several sections. He was indeed a mineralogist, chemist, geochemist, and biogeochemist, apart from uh, his philosophical works and his contribution to the history of science. By all his actions, Bernatsky proves his thesis on science as a geological force. Scientific progress, he writes, is not a random phenomenon. It has a character of a natural process taking place on the surface of the S and associated with changes in the biosphere. The biosphere appears for Vernadsky as a generalization of his ideas and as a summary of his activities in 1920-1921. He was invited to Paris by the rector of the Sorbonne Paul Appel, and these uh, Parisian years were also the years of in intense intellectual contact with Pierre de Rochardin and Edouard Leroy, philosophy, pupil of Henry Bergson. The echoes of these exchanges will be developed in uh, his fundamental work, The Biosphere, published in Russia in 1926 and in France in French in 1929. The biosphere, according to Vernadsky, is a global self-sustaining ecological system that integrates all living things and the relationships between form, uh, they form between them, sorry. Uh, for Vernadsky, ecology is a science of the biosphere. The noosphere, a neologism formed on the model of the world biosphere. According to Vernadsky and Deschardins, is the fear of human thought. In Vernadsky's original theory, the noosphere is the third in a succession of developmental uh, phases uh, of the Earth, after the geosphere, inanimate matter, and the biosphere, biological life. Um, noosphere encompasses all of the intellectual activity of the Earth. It is a kind of collective consciousness of humanity which brings together all the cerebral and mechanical activities of memorizing and processing information. To come back to Dmitry Lihachev, in the ecology of culture, he polemicizes with Vernadsky by saying that if the noosphere, smart part of the biosphere, presupposes the intelligent intervention of man in nature and in culture, we should take into account the negative effects of this intervention that the ecology of culture would be supposed to limit. This is the question of ecological ethics. The concept of the noosphere developed by Vernadsky is still to be studied in detail in the West. Because his main book on the noosphere, written in 1938, was published in Russia uh, in 1977 only, and uh, it is not translated in any language. This, uh, this book, The Scientific Thought as a Planetary Phenomenon, presents the historical process of transition from the biosphere to the noosphere. He writes, we are currently living in a period of exceptional manifestation of living matter in the biosphere, genetically 
linked to uh, the identific identification of Homo sapiens hundreds of thousands of years ago. It is the creation of a new geological force, scientific thought. Yuri Lotman and the organizing power of the Senovsky. The founder of the Moscow Tatar Semiotic School, Yuri Lotman, began to use the term semiosphere in 1984, uh, article on semiosphere published in the Sun System Studies, and uh, then developed as the second part of the book, Universe of the Mind. The article was translated into English in 2015. And for the in French translation, for example, of Lotman, of course, it's semiosphere and uh, explosion and culture. Culture and explosion, French translation by me, and the original uh, semiosphere and uh, explosion in culture. Lotman is inspired by the biosphere and the noosphere of Vernadsky sitting his works of problems of biogeochemistry. So we have a lot one in the period of uh, uh, 1984, 1990, the Moscow Tartu, Tartu Moscow School is created. The six volumes of uh, science system studies are published in Tartu with all his great Russian colleagues of some time, which is Lapovan, Toporov, Petigorsky, Nikolai, Patsyan. We still had the chance to know to meet him, uh, them personally in Moscow in uh, 2007, the international conference organized in the Lithuanian Balthrushaitis House on the occasion of the, of the publication in Russian of our translation of semiotics of passions by Gremast and Hodel. And we would like to show here some documents published in Russia in recent years and still are now in the West or um, not so now in the West, such as correspondence of Lotman with Uspensky. And in this correspondence, um, we can see Dear Boris Andreevich, I discovered in Vernadsky that life could only arise from the living if it is preceded by life. This is why he believes that life and death matter are two different fundamentals always separate and always in contact. And I'm convinced that thought can only arise from thought. All these ideas will then be taken up and described on the first page of the semiosphere. We can speak of semiosphere, right, Slotman, which we define as a semiotic space necessary for the existence and functioning of the different languages and not as a sum of the existing languages. The name semiosphere is justified, writes Lotman, because like the biosphere, which is a totality and unity of living matter and the condition of the continuation of life, the semiosphere is both the result and the condition for the development of culture. Historical process are at the head of uh, Lotman's um, latest work, Culture and Explosion. As Vyacheslav Ivanov notes, Lotman's last writings were his response to the crisis and social changes in the post-Soviet space. In culture and explosion, indeed, Lotman studies the role of unpredictability in culture. How, in short, what is unpredictable in the semiosphere can nevertheless figure there in full and make sense. Semiotics of culture in the pandemic context. In an interview with Jacques Fontanilla in 1984, Albert Julian Grimas said that semiotics is intended to deal with culture. Culture as a whole becomes the object of semiotics. In the period of social crisis and challenges, culture attracts close attention of semioticians with uh, its internal mechanisms, its ability to resist. Almost uh, 30 years ago in Culture and Explosion, Lotman noted, perhaps the most interesting moment now is that we are experiencing. Theoretically, it is perceived as a victory of real natural development over an unsuccessful historical experiment. We get the impression that these lines were written now as a reaction on the, to the ongoing sanitary crisis. With the advantage of the pandemic, the metaphorical use of the mask 
which Gray must wrote about, Larva to Sproda, has moved into everyday life. Our feelings, our relationship with the world have changed with the emergence of a closed space and the concept of confinement, with the proliferation of infodemic species, with the inventions of new forms of cultural leisure. And today's context provides us with rich material for analysis. We are talking about the mechanisms of protection of the semiosphere in response to the tests of the biosphere. Yurnatsky used an expression, blues of the biosphere. In other words, about the mechanism of our own cultural ecology inside each person. During the pandemic, a paradox arises. Traditional forms of cultural leisure, theater, cinema, museum, turned out to be inaccessible with various restrictions. But it was this vacuum that became the catalyst for many creative and innovative online projects. Who could have imagined that Russian and foreign theater, for example, would hold meetings and hold uh, and full calls with spectators and live premieres like Sovremenny Theater in Moscow? That the video of the soloists of the ballet of the Mikhailovsky Theater of St. Petersburg with rehearsals at home would collect millions of views, and that many of us would miss our favorite theaters or museums so much that these museums themselves would meet visitors and not only with virtual excursions, but with linguistics projects, um, such as Nobody Does, Board Flash Mob. Nobody speaks on a mobile phone during the performance. And no one looks at the picture. No one forgets an umbrella at the entrance. No one asks a question to the museum caretaker. Come back sooner, dear spectator or visitor. We miss you so much. The, the format of an online festival of one play would appear uh, when the work of the outstanding playwright Alexander Van Pilov, this checkup of the 20th century, would be rediscovered in a new way by, uh, by adults and uh, students and that we ourselves uh, uh, would turn into artists, painters, musicians, coming up with online performances and imitating a cultural trip to the theater. For example, put on a beautiful dress called the Friends and together everyone at home watch an interesting performance and then discuss your impression by internet. The period of the pandemic has emphasized the passions and emotions that we feel in a crisis situation as Samir Badir notes, many people understand the reaction to the virus literally. To react is to act contrary to the prescribed expectations. Is the virus predating us from acting? Then we will act no matter what. Quarantine causes an emotional reaction. It provokes passion and efforts. The main one is fear. Fear for the health of oneself and loved ones. What can the theatrical audience oppose to this feeling? The dominant passions in the relationship between the theater and its audience, for example, during the months of the pandemic, are falling in love, nostalgia, luck, in the sense of the Russian term, being born. That is, to feel the need to see someone or something. I miss you, museum. I miss your theater. This is how the spectator declares his love today. As Rado Dich, Fontaine and Lombardo suggest in the Dictionary of Literary Passions, if fear and its variant horror are centripetal, directed towards the ego, then love is centrifugal, directed toward a beloved object, object in spite of a pandemic. When you travel in the Moscow metro today, you can notice a poster with two masks. On the left is a carnival mask that cover the upper part of the face and it holds an inscription wrong. On the right is a medical mask covering the mouth and nose with the writing right. New norms of behavior, which recommend wearing medical masks everywhere, uh, literally turn all the world into a stage, according to uh, Shakespearean formula. If you analyze new cultural forms in the era of the sanitary crisis, then we understand that their emergence and development was according to the laws of the semiosphere, elemented located on the periphery, moved to the center, at first 
they are perceived as explosive and unexpected, but gradually they themselves become a new norm and the starting point. It became clear that uh, they would not disappear in the post-crisis period, that there is a new hybrid reality ahead to which we will get used. As Pushkin wrote in uh, 1834, after the cholera epidemic of 1830, there is no happiness in the world, but there is peace and freedom for a long time and every Enviable share has been dreaming long ago a tight slave had planned an escape to the abode of distant labors and pure joys. This is exactly what we were deprived in 2020-2021. Uh, Peace of mind due to the unknown timing of the end of the pandemic and uncertainty about the future. Freedom due to the introduction of the self-isolation, isolation regime and various restrictions. And finally, the perspectives of the distance abroad as an opportunity for creativity and relaxation, or both. The current health crisis will undoubtedly leave us with many lessons in many areas. But as it seems, in the sphere of culture, the most important lesson is that it is, it is a powerful antidote in response to trials, wars, and epidemics in our fragile planet. The current period seen from the future, to conclude. Today's 20, 20 years old are called Generation Z, or Sacrificed Generation. From the standpoint of UNESCO, for example, the main thing for this young generation is to be resilient. According to Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General of UNESCO, being young can be exciting and fun, but it is always challenging. It was not easy before the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is all the more difficult during this time. In many years, young generations will be able to give a real assessment of these events, and much of what we feel and predict today will seem obvious to them. However, we hope to make, to make our physical contribution to the humanitarian comprehension and coverage of the present period. And it is important to uh, emphasize one more issue, the role of the humanities in making sense of the pandemic. At the beginning of this year, together with our colleagues, semioticians and humanity scholars from 12 countries, we held a round table on this topic and published the book, New Normality, New Life Forms, Semiotics in the Era of Crisis. So we want to quote one th uh, thought from this book. These are the words of Dominic Reynaud, climatologist, Nobel Prize for Peace from the University of Grenoble, France. We actually stop harming the biological diversity of life. And if we continue, we can really limit the process of global warming. There is an opportunity to start a better life right now, but the risk cannot be ruled out that as a result of the pandemic, humanity will learn nothing. And the world after the end of the danger will look the same as before, only worse. The post-pandemic world is a prospect that awaits us. Our mission is to understand the challenge that, that has come and also understand the role of culture as a way of perceiving the crisis, countering it and preventing new threats. In conclusion, we would like to turn to the point of view of writer's view, to the point of, of the writer's view, because as everyone knows, writers often turn out to be prophets. Nikolai Gogol concluded his poem, Dead Souls, with the following reasoning. Um, it is easy for the reader to judge, looking down from his comfortable corner at the top from which the whole horizon opens out upon all that is going all on the roof, where man can see only the nearest object. The current generation now sees everything clearly. It marvels at the errors. It loves at the folly of its ancestors. Not seeing this, this chronicle is all overscored by divine fire. By the 
but, but the current generation loves and truly begins a series of new eras at which their descendants will also love afterwards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ina. Thank you very much for this presentation, which makes a parallel with the current pandemic and the experience we all uh, went through. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Do we have any in the chat? Adin, do we have a question or is... I was, I was looking around for questions. I always have questions. I, but I have too many questions. I think. Well, I have one, but a quick one. Actually, I'm not um, specialized in the field that uh, you were um, presenting, Ina. I was wondering whether, um, when it comes to nanosphere, is information part of it or it's only knowledge? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very good question. And uh, the other aspect is uh, the relationship between nosphere and semiosphere. Um, I think uh, nosphere is seen by, uh, by Vernadsky as a, a step, a next step of uh, the development. Um, it is not known only knowledge. It is, uh, like Lotman says, knowledge and potential, all kinds of knowledge realized and to be realized. And uh, as for sphere, of course, uh, is the condition to, uh, for the existence of culture, like Lord Masses. Yeah, thank you very much for this clear explanation. Do we have uh, any other questions in the chat or in the room? It was because it was very clear, <laughs> your presentation was clear and we could um, adhere to the experience you were presenting. Thank you very much, Ina. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.